house of the Lord. Let me make sure I turn on. Okay, I am. Okay, praise God. It's good to be in the house of the Lord here tonight. It's so good to see all of you on this Wednesday night in church tonight. Amen. It's so good to be here in the house of the Lord. I'm so thankful for what God is doing. I had uh, two receive the Holy Ghost on Sunday and one get baptized in Jesus' name. And we are thankful for Excited so far that you'll be baptized eight in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We're thankful for that. We praise for that. And I'm just believing that there are more on the way. Amen. 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 And more on the way. And I'm excited about what God is doing in this place and in our midst here. In our midst here as a church, collectively. Right. Amen. If you have your Bibles, turn to the book of 1 Kings chapter 21. The book of 1 Kings chapter 21. I'm going to read a few verses of scripture, starting at verse 15 through verse 19. Uh, this is the message that God gave to me Monday, and I had something else lined up that I was going to preach, but late Monday, the Lord just began to talk to my heart about some things, and I said, okay, well, we're just going to kind of go with it and see where we go tonight. But the book of 1 Kings chapter 21, the book of 1 Kings chapter 21, starting at verse 15, and I'm reading out of the King James Version, and it says, and it came to pass when Jezebel heard that Naboth was stoned and was dead, that Jezebel said to Ahab, Arise, take possession of the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite, which he refused to give thee for money, for Naboth is not alive but dead. Verse 16, And it came to pass when Ahab heard that Naboth was dead, that Ahab rose up to go down to the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite to take possession of it. Verse 17 says, And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Arise, go down to meet Ahab in Israel, king of Israel, which is in Samaria. Behold, he's in the vineyard of Naboth, whether he has gone down to possess it. And verse 19 says, And thou shalt speak unto him, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Hast thou killed and also taken possession? And thou shalt speak unto him, saying, Thus saith the Lord, In the place where dogs lick the blood of Naboth, shall dogs lick thy blood, even thine. And from these passages of scripture here tonight, with the help of the Lord, I want to speak or preach on this thought. The spirit of an enabler. The spirit of an enabler. Can we pray together and ask God that he would help us and help me to live what he's given to me? Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we love you. God, we thank you for this opportunity to have me come into your presence and pray. God, I ask that you speak to us in a special way. Open up our ears that we might hear in our hearts and receive the word. God, speak to your servant. Have me say what you want me to say this precious body of believers that have gathered together in your name. We'll be sure to give you the praise, glory, and honor due unto you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Confirm your word tonight with miracles, signs, and wonders to follow. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. You may be seated here this evening. Thank you for standing for the reading of God's word here tonight. The spirit of an enabler. Now, to give you a little bit of backstory about Ahab and Jezebel, we've got to go back a little bit. Uh, to after David was king and he passed the throne onto his son Solomon there at the end of 2 Samuel and Solomon became king <clears throat> and Solomon the Lord had asked Solomon ask me of whatever it is you want and I will give it to you and Solomon said he said he said Lord give me wisdom that I may judge your people and the Bible says that the Lord said because thou hast asked for this and not riches that you will not only will I possess you with wealth, but you'll be the wisest person that's ever lived. So Solomon wrote Proverbs and he wrote Ecclesiastes and of course he wrote the book Song of Solomon. Proverbs and Ecclesiastes are books on wisdom. The Song of Solomon is a love story. But from Solomon, Solomon he first started out following, the, following after the things of God and, and, and the precepts that his father David had put in place. But the Bible also says that Solomon married over 700 women, women from all different parts of the world. And, he, and they did that in those times for political alliances. And each one of these different wives that Solomon got married to didn't all follow the God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Jacob. They came from different lands and different cultures and had different ideologies and different things that they wanted to do. They had idols that they worshipped, and they brought those, those things into the land of Israel. And before long, they began to uh, lay on to Solomon, and Solomon began to let go of some things that, that, were, that were once near and dear to him. 
And because of it, the nation of Israel began to fall down a dark road. In fact, it got so bad that even the kings that came after Solomon, it got, it got worse with them that Israel split into two kingdoms. The northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. The northern kingdom had wicked kings the whole time. The southern kingdom had a few good kings that were, that were leading the children of Israel and trying to help them uh, serve the Lord. But they, but they had a few mixed in there when you go and read in, in first and second kings. And they had some, some that just didn't want to do right. The northern kingdom had its share of kings that just were just vile and wicked and evil. And this is where we get to Ahab and Jezebel. Ahab and Jezebel were the king and queen of the northern kingdom. Ahab was an Israelite. Jezebel came from another land. But those that talked about Jezebel, you, you understand that she was a very wicked and vile woman. And in fact, when you hear someone say someone has the spirit of Jezebel, they automatically assume that it's rebellion, that it's anti-authority, that it's I do what I want and go where I want. And usually we try to associate that spirit with women. But the spirit of Jezebel can sit on men too. Yes, amen. Men can get can 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 push against authority, and men can and can can do things that go against the word of God. Right. Yes, amen. But I'm going to do my best here to get us to understand that Jezebel and Ahab, people knew what they were all about. In fact, Jezebel was so wicked that she went about killing the prophets that came to preach to her and Ahab. God would send prophets; she would have them killed. It got so bad that Obadiah. Who was a governor under Ahab. And, I, and there's a book in the Bible called Obadiah. That Obadiah took some of those prophets and hid them in caves. He took a hundred of them. And hid fifty in a cave and fifty in another cave. And then he fed them with bread and water. Because he got tired of seeing the men of God that would come to Ahab and Jezebel. And come to preach to them the word of God and say listen. You're not living right. Listen you're not doing right. Listen there are some things you need to get in order. And because Jezebel was anti-authority and didn't believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Jacob. She's like, who do you think you are telling me how I need to live and how I need to act? Don't you realize I'm the queen of this land? Don't you realize I have the power to take your life? And so she would make sure that they were killed. And Ahab sitting there, just letting, letting her do whatever she wanted to do. He knew she, how she was and didn't want to stop what she was doing. But tonight I'm going to do my best to help us understand that about the spirit of an enabler. And why we've got to be careful of that spirit getting a hold of us. Because when we know when someone's doing wrong and we don't say anything about it, we're just as guilty. When we know that there are things going on and we refuse and we turn the blind eye. Even me as pastor, when things pop up in front of me and I know that God wants me to deal with it. And people sometimes wonder, is Pastor Cole going to handle that right away? Sometimes there might be a time where I handle it right away. Or there might be times where I'm waiting on the Lord to give me a specific instruction on how to move. Right. And sometimes I move behind the scenes because people think that we don't know things. Yes, we are aware of some things because my wife and I observe before we act. You can catch a lot. You can know a lot about things if you observe. Right. Right. And we sit back and we observe situations sometimes. And it's from that observation that sometimes God will say, aha, you need to put your eye on that. Or sometimes God will say, just take a step back and just let things unfold. You don't have to get it. You don't have to do something right now because my spirit is working and a spirit of conviction has come upon them. And they recognize what they're doing and they recognize that some things are not right. So let my spirit work and bring conviction on them. And over time, you're going to see a change. Keep preaching truth. Keep loving people. Keep reaching for people and let my word do the work it's supposed to do. Because my word can wash people. My word can change people. My word can help people overcome it. My word can help people walk in power and in destiny. But you just need to stay in the word. Yes, amen. So you're probably wondering tonight, Pastor Cole, where are you going with this about the spirit of an enabler? Well, I'm glad you asked me about that because there are quite a few things about this. And I'm going to try my best. I was praying today. said, God, help me to preach this. There are a lot of things that we that when you talk about enabling, basically we're allowing things to go on that we know we shouldn't and we should stop. We're allowing things to go on that 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 we realize are wrong, but 
We don't want to say anything because we don't want to be the bad guy. We don't want to say anything because we don't want someone to talk about us. Can I tell you that I've always said this. If you love someone, you always got to tell them the truth, even if it's, even if it's harsh. Yes. It's not fun to have hard conversations. Right. It's not fun to be the person that has to have a conversation with someone and, and be a little bit direct. Yeah. Because I know that in my role, sometimes I catch a lot of heat for things that I say. I know that in my role, that comes with the territory of being pastor. Not everybody's going to like everything that I have to, that I say. But I also understand that God has put a mandate upon me. That when things go on, I have to sound an alarm. Yes. That says you've got to be careful because wolves have come in disguised as sheep. And yeah. they're watching you and they're trying to find a way to take you out. Right. And they're trying to find a way to get next to you. Yeah. And they're trying to find a way to, set, to get next to you. Why? Because they recognize a point of weakness. And they recognize you're struggling. So what they're going to do is try to befriend you and then get close to you. And then when you let down your guard, they're going to devour you. And when a spirit of enabling gets in here, and we kind of think that's why you've got to have a spirit of discernment. Yeah. Uh -huh. You've got to be aware. The Bible says we are to be as wise as a serpent, yeah. yet as harmless as a dove. Yes. In other words, we cannot be ignorant of the devil's devices when things pop up in front of us. Right. Because I will tell you, I have heard story after story, talking with pastors, and even when I served in youth ministry, horror stories of people that, that they, they, they were letting things go on in their life and, and leadership recognized it. Leadership was saying, listen, if you keep allowing this or keep enabling this spirit into your life, it will cause destruction in, upon you and upon your family. Right. Yes. Come on. But you don't know what you're talking about. You don't know what you're saying. I can do what I want to do because it's my prerogative. And it's what I want to do. And that's how Jezebel was. She was like, I'm queen. Ahab's king. We can do what we want to. We can go where we want to go. And because of the wickedness of the northern kingdom, eventually it led to where that entire kingdom was taken into captivity into Persia. Because you read about it after first and second kings in the Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. Is when the children of Israel are in bondage in Persia because they had leaders that neglected the word of God. And we live in a world today that neglects the word of God. We live in a world today that's all about do what you want to. Go where you want to. We know you're not living right, but because we don't want to say anything to you, we're just going to let it go and just let the chips fall where they may. Rather than say there's danger ahead and you're about to walk off a cliff. Rather than say, I'm trying to reach for you because I don't want your life to be destroyed. Yeah. Rather than say, listen, I love you, but the path that you're on is going to lead to destruction. Right. The path that you're on is not going to just destroy you, but it's going to destroy your family right. too. Right. And we have got to be careful. Because the spirit of an enabler knows that we can involve things someone wants to do, but does nothing to convince them that what they're doing is actually wrong. Proverbs 11, 14 says, where no counsel is, the people fall. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. Yes. The Bible talks about that, that there's safety. Even you heard the saying, says that there's safety in numbers. Yes. There's safety within the herd. Why? When, when a predator is looking, uh, if you ever see those nature shows, a predator is looking for an animal that wants to devour. Mm -hmm. And they see a young, and they see a youngling. You notice that the older, more wiser animals of the herd surround the youngest one. Right. Mm -hmm. Because they recognize and, and they face the enemy. Uh -huh. They never have their back to the enemy. Uh -huh. They face them head on. Right. To say if you want to get to them you got to come through us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But we're not going to let you enter in. We're not going to allow you to come in. And disrupt what God wants to do. Right. We've got to stop allowing or enabling spirits of divisiveness and wickedness. And, yes. bi and backbiting and gossip in. Yes. Because we're not going to be a church that does gossip or tail bearing as the Bible says. Yeah. We're not going to be that church that talks about people. And, and, even if, and even if you know it, sometimes it's not okay. Help me, Lord. Just because you hear things doesn't mean, and I hear a lot of stuff. And let me just take it from my perspective. I hear a lot of things that come across my desk. But everything that I hear, I can't always share. Why? Because of confidentiality. There are things about people that I know that others may not know. And why do I need to keep confidentiality? To protect people. Yes. Because it's my job to protect. Yes. Just like as a parent or a guardian, it's your job to protect. 
and say, I'm not going to allow these things into my home. I'm not going to allow these things in, 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 into, into my house because it's going to affect the spirit of my home. And so, yes, I'm going to say this. I might make some folks mad that it's okay, parents and, and grandparents and guardians, to be able to monitor what your kids put on social media. Yes. I have said things that we've got to be careful we post on social media. Why? Because people know that we go to church and people know that we're Christian and they're watching you and they may make a decision to come to church. But because we post something on social media that doesn't line up with our Christian beliefs, it causes somebody else to say, why would I want to go to church when you posted something that's contrary to who you say you are? Come on. Come on. Why would I want to know about a God when you're posting things that don't match up with what you're doing? You're, 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 you're allowing some things into your life that don't look good. Can I tell you, people are watching you. And I've been trying to teach, and I understand that they're for some of us. Where we placed you, it's new to you in leadership. We understand that. We're providing structure to where there's no structure. And we understand that in that moment, there's going to be some, some, some uneasiness. Because you may not have been in a position where people are watching you. But I'm here to tell you that as a leader, you're being watched. Yes. And not just what you say. And not just what you do. They're watching how you dress too. Yeah. Yes. Come on. I'm Come telling on. you. We have got to stop allowing things into our lives that are disrupting what God wants to do. I feel the Holy Ghost now. I feel my help coming in here. We've got to stop allowing some things into our spirit now. That's causing us to... To abandon the godly principles that God wants us to have as men and women of God. Yes. And if we're going to make a difference in the world around us, yes. we've got to tune out the ear, to tune out the voices yes. that are trying to get us to bow down to a world that wants us to compromise and wants us to bow down to a world that wants us to give in to what God has called. Yes. Come on. We can't allow those things. We can't allow those voices that try to enable us that say, oh, it's okay. Everybody's doing it. Why don't you do it too? You've heard the saying, if, you, if, if your friends jump off, off, off a bridge, will you do it too? I heard that a lot growing up. My mom would say to me, she would say, son, you can't dance on every set. Meaning you can't, you can't be a part of every little thing. Because not everything that you see is good for you. And I didn't understand that. Even as, as I grew up, as I grew from a child and into adolescence, got into my teenage years. And as a teenager, I felt that my parents didn't know anything. I felt like, Mom, Dad, you don't know anything. I thought they were born old. I turned 42 this year, so my kids were like, you're old. But they told me, they're like, listen, son, we were teenagers. We know about the struggles teenagers deal with and all the things they deal with in school and the pressures of today. Right. Now being born in, I was born in 1981, you go through the 80s and then into the 90s and culture began to change and different things began to be presented to me as a teenager that I, that I, 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 I sort of kind of grasped a little bit of, but some things I, quite, I didn't quite understand. And, and there were other kids that were trying to get me to do things that, that weren't appropriate. I remember walking the halls of my high school and walking into the bathroom and kids in there lighten up joints. Mm -hmm. So yes, I know what weed smells like. Mm -hmm. No, I did not go in the bathroom. But there were kids in there. I saw things in high school. The kids were doing things. Yeah. And wanting me to participate in. Mm -hmm. I saw things. Kids gambling in the bathroom. Yeah. Rolling dice and flipping dollars. Mm -hmm. Playing spades. I saw all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Kids fighting over, over, over a dollar that someone owed them. Get mad over things that really you like you shouldn't be getting mad about. And it was an environment that people were trying to get me to partake in. Hey, you got a job. Why don't you put some money down? Hey, why don't you go to this party? Why don't you go be a part of this? Or why don't you go participate in this? I know those pressures. I know what it's like. It's not just when you're a teenager, but even when you become an adult that there are pressures that society puts on you to compromise who God has called you to be. I've come to sound an alarm here tonight to get you to wake up and realize that God has called you and God has created you with a purpose and with destiny. Yes. And don't you understand that the devil wants to rob you of what God has put in you. Yes. Yes. Oh, yes. The devil wants you to allow people into your life uh, that will speak negatively to you. Yes. Or get you to back away from what God has called you to do. 
Why are you trying to be a Christian? Why are you trying to serve God? Why are you going to church? Why are you trying to be holy? I'm going to tell you why they say that to you. Because they feel conviction. That's right. That's right. They feel conviction. And because they feel conviction, because they don't recognize it as conviction, they view it as condemnation. They don't recognize that as conviction that God's trying to draw them to change. So they recognize it as, oh, you're judging me. You think you're better than me. And so what happens is, is it causes us to, to put our light under a bushel. The enabler all of a sudden, no, I, I done got to you now. Hide, hide your light. So now you, wherever you go, when you get around family, you hide your light because you don't want to make people feel, feel a certain type of way. I love my family. I got some family that doesn't live for God, and I love them to death. But there are some things they post on social media that I don't like. And I'm not liking their posts either. Because I'm not going to endorse what they're doing. I love them. And they know I do. But it's wrong for me to endorse sin. I can't do that. And so when you're on social media and you're looking at family's posts, and it's, you might, there might be a nice picture they're doing, oh, that's great. And that's wonderful. But if they're doing something that's not godly, why are we liking the posts in the first place? That's just saying, I, 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 I accept what you're doing. I'm okay with that. My family, people know, we know that we love, they know we love them. But when we get together and they know where I stand, we just don't talk about it, really. We just don't talk about it. We talk about something else because they already know that that's a line I've drawn in the sand. And some of us got to make up our mind where we're going to draw a line in the sand at. Where's the boundary going to be set up? And God has set the boundary around us. But are we going to let God do what he wants to do? Right. Are we going to also draw a line in the sand yes. and say, this is my boundary. Right. God has called me out of darkness yeah, and into his marvelous life. Yes. I'm not going to allow a spirit that wants me to bow down. I'm not going to allow a spirit that wants me to give in. Yes. You think of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the book of Daniel. They're standing there before that that image of Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar gave them a warning and said, when the music is played, you better bow or you're going to meet a fiery furnace. Those three young men got up and said, oh king, we will not bow to your idol. If, even if you throw us in the furnace, we believe that the God that we serve is able to deliver us from the fiery furnace. So you can talk about me all you want to. You can say what you want to. You can try to come against me and my God. But God's been too good to me. You don't know what my life was like before God got a hold of me. I refuse to allow a spirit of the age cause me to fall off of what God has for me. Amen. I refuse. I refuse to allow a spirit to come in and cause me to be divisive or cause me to gossip or cause me to slander. Yes, now that I've gotten older, I, I kind of recognize those things. I remember in high school, I graduated from high school in 1999. So it'll be almost 30 years here soon. I can't believe that. It, it, it blows my mind. It, blo it blows my mind that when you talk about 30 years ago, you're referring to the 90s. Go a little bit further back, say 40 years ago, the 80s. 50 years ago, you're like the 70s. You're like, wait a minute, slow down here. <laughs> and then, yes, further on. <laughs> but I remember in high school, kids had this thing called a slam book. Oh, yeah. And I remember seeing some of those things, and they would write someone's name at the top. Mm -hmm. And in that slam book, they would write down things about that person and say things like, some of those things I saw were just horrible what they say about people. Yes. Things like they are a loser and they're ugly and no one would ever date them, and someone, they would rather date a dog than, I mean, horrible things yes. that they would write about people. And, then, and, and, and you would look at this, you're like, my, my goodness, why would you want to write something like this about somebody? Yeah. Why would you want to say something like this about somebody? And all the snickering and all that stuff, and, and, and rumors get started up because of it. Mm -hmm. The Bible says in Proverbs 11, verse 13, it says, The tale bearer reveal, reveal the secrets. But he that is of a faithful spirit concealeth the matter. Yes. In other words, it's talking about a gossiper revealeth secrets. But he that is of a faithful spirit will hide it. Yes. I saw it, but I'm not going to say anything. Uh -huh. 
Because a gossiper is going to say something about it. Right. Regardless of no matter how old you are, gossip does nothing but destroy people. Right. 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 And it will destroy a church if we let it. Yes. Yes. Right. Amen. People come in with all types of issues and all types of things. And the last thing that they want is to be talked about. You don't know everybody's story that's in here. That's right. That's right. Everybody's got a different story. Right. And we need to be thankful that God's not revealing our, our stuff yeah. That's right. and the stuff that we've done and how bad we've been. Yeah. But because we've been washed in the blood and God's shown us mercy and grace, yeah. he's covered it under the blood. Yeah. And the last thing we want is for God to bring up our stuff and bring up our baggage. Yeah. And there are people coming in with wounds. Let's not be the reason that they don't pursue a deeper walk with yeah. God. Yes, yeah. come on. Let's not be the reason that someone doesn't give their life to God because they're worried about someone talking yeah. about them. Or someone saying something about them. Or someone being divisive. Or someone trying to tear them down. Because a person's name is all that they have. That's right. Come on. If we slander their name, what else do they have? They've got nothing to stand on to slander their name. And when you go back into our text about Naboth, Ahab was walking through Naboth's vineyard because it was near the palace. He looked at that vineyard and was like, man, I'd love to have that vineyard for me. Sees Naboth walking through his vineyard and says, hey, how much are you going to sell it for? Naboth's like, I'm sorry, king, it's not for sale. This has been in my family for generations. We can't, we can't sell this. Right. I'm going to give this on to the next generation. It's been in our family for years and years and years. And Ahab didn't like that. So Ahab decides he's going to go home. You can go read the story there in, in 1 Kings chapter 21. He goes home back to the palace and Jezebel sees him sitting there having a, having a little temper tantrum, whatever it is. She's like, you're the king. You can, you can get whatever you want. Well, Naboth won't sell me his vineyard. I, I want it, but he won't give it to me. Jezebel's like, I got it. So she gets some letters and puts Ahab's signet on it. Deception. Sends it out, telling the, telling the, the nobles and the elders that Naboth had said things that blasphemed God. So she stayed as a trial to have an innocent man. This is why you need to be careful what you say. About gossip That's right. and divisiveness. Because an innocent man was led to the slaughter and was stoned to death. Yep. Because somebody coveted something that they had. Right. And when they said, no, you can't have it, they said something that they didn't like. They came up with a plan to have their character destroyed. Mm -hmm. And because of it, someone lost their life. Mm -hmm. This is exactly why you can't allow a spirit of divisiveness. To get in your ear. Yeah. Just because something said that you don't like. And doesn't, that you don't agree with. Right. Everything that comes across the pulpit. I don't agree with. But I know that it's necessary. Yeah. Because God wants me saved. Yeah. God cares more about you being saved than he does your happiness. Come on. Yeah. Come on. Right. Come on. We get caught up in the thing. Well God wants me happy. No God wants you saved. And if it means he's got to step on your toes. Then he will do it. Yeah. Because at the end he wants to say to you and I. Well done thou good and faithful yeah. servant. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We're getting this thing so much that God wants you, God wants you to be rich. Let's, let me tell you something. That prosperity gospel, that's not. God wants you blessed. It doesn't say anything about you being rich. That's right. That's right. Now, there are, now, there are people that God does bless with, with, with a seven-figure bank account because he knows they can handle it. And some of them, yes, go to church. And I'm already praying. Lord, you know where to send them. <laughs> You know where to send but, but even if God never blesses you with that kind of money, you're still blessed. That's right. That's right. That's right. You're, you're still blessed. You may not think you are, but you're blessed. Because when you look back over your life and how, how far God has brought you and what God has kept you from, yes. mm -hmm. you are blessed. Yes. Amen. Don't let the devil get you dissatisfied with the blessings God's already given you. Yes, because sometimes we want to covet more. Well, I wish I had more. And I, I wish I had this. And God's like, can you just sit back and be thankful with what I've given you? Amen. Because if you can be thankful with what I've given you, then I know you'll appreciate greater when it comes down your way. Right. But can you also uh, rejoice with someone else who's been blessed when it hasn't even been you? Yes. Amen. Amen. See, Naboth had a vineyard and Ahab wanted it. Ahab got covetous of it. And the Bible even talks about the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not covet. Right. Covet things of your neighbor. It also says thou shalt not bear false witness against your neighbor. That's in the Ten Commandments. Mm -hmm. yeah. So to lie, to deceive, deception, 
Cheat. Cheat somebody out, out, of, out of money. That's not of God. That's not Christian-like. God's watching that. And we get mad and frustrated because we're like, God, when are you going to get them? Because we're, we're wanting God to act. Like right now, God, get your sword out and just go ahead and go to swing and cut them down. And we think, and then after a while, we feel like they've gotten away with it. They haven't gotten away with it. Because I'm reminded in the Bible that it says, Vengeance is mine, I will repay all, thus saith the Lord. Amen. So when we think someone's gotten off with deception, or someone's gotten off with, with lying and cheating, they ain't gotten off with God. God already sees it. And in, and in time, it's going to come into their life. But in the meantime, we've got to keep our heart right and keep our attitude right. And not allow a spirit to come in that's going to cause us to move off the blessings that God wants to give us. I hope I'm making sense tonight. Yes. Because I, I really felt this in my spirit. And I was asking God, I'm like, God, how can I preach this? Because I preached a few weeks ago about the spirit of a drifter. And I talked about drifting and how we can allow things in our life that will cause us to drift. But even when we enable things or we allow things, sometimes we drift because we're allowing things into our life. That's causing us to drift. Yeah. The music we listen to. Come on now. But everything we listen to is appropriate to listen to. Some of the music today, my, my goodness, yeah. the lyrics of them, if you listen to the lyrics of them, yeah. why are you putting it in, into your ears? Right. It's affecting your spirit. Yes. Yep. It's affecting your attitude. Yes. Right. It's affecting how you interact with people. Right. When we wonder why you're grumpy and you're angry, mm. you probably listen to something by someone who wrote a song about anger and, and wanting to, to punch somebody and beat, some, and beat somebody up because they looked at them crazy. And you come in with a bad attitude. And sometimes when I'm preaching, I feel that. I feel that. Because you ain't listening to anything, anything godly. You're letting something else into that's not of God into your spirit. Right. And it's settled on you. And then you wonder why you can't break free. Yeah. Because you, allow, you enabled or allowed something into your spirit that is settled on you. And then you come into the house of God. And because you've allowed it, it's got you cold and callous to the spirit of God. Right. So when the Spirit of God begins to move and the Spirit of God begins to touch, you don't know how to respond because for some, because it's been so long since we felt the presence of God, even though we're in the presence of God, we don't know how to respond. So tonight, I'm going to tell you, I've been to youth, group, youth, youth services where we lit a bonfire and our youth pastor would say, get all that music, get all those CDs and get all those books and put them in the bonfire. And we're going to burn this stuff up because we're going to make a declaration that no, we're going to allow that stuff into our spirit. But we've got a made up mind that we're going to go on before we're going to go on and we're going to serve God. I've got a made up mind. I'm not going to allow things into my house. You may not want to live for God, but I've made up my mind. I'm going to live for God because Jesus is soon to come. And this, this world is it's wrapping up soon, folks. And I don't have time to sit back and watch you complain. I don't have time to sit back and watch you murmur. I've got to get my heart right. I've got to get my attitude right. I've got to get my spirit right because there's junk that I've allowed into my spirit. And I need a touch from God to help me break through. Yes. Amen. Amen. I need a touch from God to help me. When's the last time you prayed and really felt a touch from God? I feel the spirit of God tugging on some people here tonight. I do. God's tugging on your heart. I feel it. Because there's people in this room, you've been battling some things. You've been fighting some things. You've been fighting some, some, some spirits that are trying to come against you. You've been fighting loneliness. And you've been fighting. You've been, some of you have even been dealing with suicidal thoughts. And I come against that in the name of Jesus. It's, it's the will of God for you to live. Not to die. And the devil's trying to get in your ear telling you to take your life. To throw it all away. But I'm coming with a word from the Lord. If you've ever heard God reach for you, he's reaching for you today. Yes. That he's called you and commissioned you to live. He's got a purpose and a destiny for you. I feel the Holy Ghost so strong. There's somebody in here. I don't know who you are. But just this week, the devil's been talking to you to just, just give up. Jesus. And throw your life away. Right. I come against that spirit in the name of Jesus. Because that's not the will of God. Right. I come against that because they're trying to attack your mind right now. Even right now as I'm preaching, trying to attack your mind and trying to get you to think I come against. I'm, let's, let's take a moment. Let's pray right now. Lord, in the name of Jesus, I come against every spirit that tried to exalt itself against the knowledge of who you are. I take authority right now in the name of Jesus that your angels be loosed in this house right now. 
Let there be liberty. Let there be freedom. Let there be joy. Let there be victory. Let there be peace. The devil will not get the final say. For you have the final say. For you come to set the captive free. You come to break the chains of addiction. You come to break the shackles of sin that have tried to sit on us. And I pray right now in the name of Jesus Christ. Let liberty, let freedom move in this place right now. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Something's starting to move right now. I know I'm in the Holy Ghost. I know I'm in the Holy Ghost. Because God wants to break some chains. God wants to break some shackles. And there are people, you're bound by some stuff because you've allowed some things into your spirit. Now, it may have been unintentional. You may not intentionally have the, had, had in your mind to allow it in. But somehow it's, it's made its way in. A little crack there. A little crack here that's made its way in. And that's, and the devil's trying to talk to you. The Spirit's trying to talk to you. To get you to just walk away from the promises of God. To get you to just give up and, 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 and throw your life away. It's the will of God that you live. It's the will of God that you become what God has called you to be. It's the will of God that you walk in power and authority and destiny. The devil's fighting you so hard because he knows what God's put in you. He knows that God's called you. He knows that God has gifted you. He knows that God has equipped you. And he knows that God has equipped this church to do a work for God. But the devil also is aware. And he's tried to come in as a wolf disguised in sheep's clothing to try to bring divisiveness and try to bring a spirit of division and try to do whatever he can to knock us off what God has for us. But he, the Lord has woken me up in my spirit and I've got on the full armor of God that I may be able to withstand the wiles of the devil. I've got my sword of the spirit and I've put on the blessed plate of righteousness and I've got on the helmet of salvation. I have my feet shot with the gospel of preparation of peace and I'm going to war and I've got the shield of faith uh, to let the devil know you come this far but you're not coming any farther. We're tired of you coming to our church and messing with our parents and messing with our children and messing with the people of God. Uh, we've got a destiny uh, and we're going to march on to what God has for us. Yes. It's the will of God. It's the will of God. I refuse to allow the devil to come in and disrupt what God wants to do. I refuse to allow the devil to come in and just wreak havoc. No, no, no. My spirit's been stirred. Monday night, God just began to talk to my heart right before I went to bed. Had another message I was trying to preach. And I'm trying, I'm like, Lord, I'm trying to get some discipleship in, in the, into these people and trying to help them get a, 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 a sure footing. But God's like, there's some things that you've got to weed out and got to cut down. Every once in a while, you've got to go into a garden. You've got to pluck up weeds. Why? Because the weeds will choke out the life of the plant. Yeah. That's trying to grow. And God has planted a seed into this church. I don't know if you noticed, folks. We've been having some powerful moves of God these last few services. Yeah. God is on the move. Yeah. And God is doing things. But we got an adversary that's like, uh-uh. Come on. we got an adversary that's like, nope. You're trying to have a move of God. Let me find a way to shut it down. Let me bring in weapons of, this, of mass distraction yeah. to knock you off your purpose and have you focus on, on the mundane stuff on. rather than being focused on what you need to be focused on. And people are getting distracted and getting frustrated uh, because we've allowed the devil to, to distract us with other things mm -hmm. than what our purpose is. And we're fighting with one another rather than showing love to one another. We're bickering amongst ourselves. Uh, help us, Lord. Jesus. The devil knows what he's doing. Yes. Why? Because he doesn't want us to be what God's called us to be. I can, I can already tell you just this week, my wife and I have gotten text messages from other preachers that we know that, that God has shown them our church and God has told them there's a harvest for this church. Yes. That God has prepared a harvest for this church, but the right. devil has come to try to rob that harvest from us. Right. Right. Already told us that there's a harvest that's out there, that there are souls that are out there. People are telling me, Pastor, uh, I've had a dream of water flowing out of the sanctuary into the community. Yeah. Yes, amen. The spirit of God flowing. Out of here to the community, yes. Yes. to people that are hungry and are thirsty. But the devil's like, I want to stop the well. I want to stop it from flowing. I, I want to do whatever I can to get it gunked up with junk and crime and dirt and filth and whatever I can get in because people are not allowing the Spirit of God to flush their spirit out. And if we don't allow the Spirit of God to wash us and the Spirit of God to cleanse us, the Spirit of God to change us, then we yes. spiritually will die. You ever notice when you look at towns and communities, 
that back in the and when they were settling settling the, the new the new world they called it here in America. They always built civilizations near water. Why is that? Because there was life there. Wherever the water was, there was life. But if the water dried up, they would vacate. And they would move. Why? Because there's no life coming. The same is with us in the spirit. Is when we don't allow the Holy Ghost to flow on a regular basis in our lives. A lot of gunk begins to get built up in our spirits. A lot of unsettledness begins to get built up in our spirits. A lot of things that we're dealing with gets, get, get built up in our spirits. And we just have things that are, that are there that we need to properly deal with and let the Spirit of God flush it out of us so that God can do a work in us and through us. But we just allow some things to just, to just, to just build up and build up and build up and build up. And the river in our lives has dried up. When's the last time you've talked in tongues? Oh, yeah. When's the last time you got a good dose of the Holy Ghost? And I mean you got a dose that was so good you know God touched you. Oh, yes. You know God changed you. You know God cleaned some things out of you yes. that weren't fit to be there. You, you know that God was doing a work in you because God wants to do a work in us. Yes. And God wants to use all of us yes. to fulfill his will for Waycross. But I'm telling you that the adversary of our soul has recognized of what's going on. He's not naive. That's why we need to be on our face and we need to pray. Because yes. prayer breaks down strongholds. Yes. Yes. Prayer yes. tears down the walls of the yes. enemy. And prayer invites the spirit of God in. And when we begin to pray and begin to do warfare in the spirit, yes. 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 things begin to happen. Yes. Yes. And we can stand on the word and begin to tear down the things of God. As I get ready to draw to a close here tonight, Let's not allow, this, let's not allow the, the things of the devil to rob us of the blessings that God wants to give us. Let's not allow the things of the world to penetrate our spirit and cause us to, to move away from what God has for us as a church yes. and what God has for us individually. I can tell you that God has a work for this church. I can tell you Amen. that God wants to do things in our, in our midst. I can tell you that the blessings that God has for us, they're, they're on the way. They're sitting right there hovering. But who will reach up and who will grab it? Right. Who will reach up and say, and say, God, I want what you have. Yes. Who will reach up and say, God, as for me and my house, yes. we're going to get things in order. Yes. As for me and my house, we're going to get our spirits right. As for me and my house, we're going to seek to forgive. We're going to seek to love. We're going to seek to show grace and mercy. We're going to seek to show those things. Why? Because I want there to be a move of God. And I want the spirit of God to move. And I want yes. the spirit of God to, to, to dwell here. And I want when people see us, the Bible says we'll be known by our love one for another. Right. And when we're bickering and fighting amongst ourselves, God's not pleased. The devil's happy about it, but God's not pleased. Because God's like, you're missing, you're missing the big picture. Yes. You're missing what I want to do. And you're missing on how I want to move. Yes. As we all stand across this house here tonight. <laughs> On this Wednesday night. At 8.04 p.m. The Spirit of God is just speaking. And if you need a touch from God, he's here. Even on a Wednesday night, God, I believe that God can move on a Wednesday night. We don't have to wait till Sunday to call down the power of God. The same God that was here on Sunday, the same God that's here tonight. Yes. And he can do a work in your life and do a, do a work in your family and instantaneously, suddenly change things for you and your family. Alter destinies and change things for you. So whatever it is maybe going on, maybe it's just life. And, and we've all been there. I've been there. Where life just gets us. And life just has a way of weighing us down and, and causing us to, to, allow, to allow junk to just get built up in our spirit. And we get angry. We get frustrated. It's not intentional, but it just happens. It's just life. And we just need God to just come and let his spirit just flow over us and just wash us and just cleanse us and just renew us and renew our mind and renew our thinking and give us a, a different outlook on our situation. Give us some joy. Give us some peace. Give us some hope. 
So tonight, I'm going to do something a little different here tonight. I feel the Lord just instructing me that, you know, we need to, we need to get together and pray as, as, as families tonight. And, and maybe, and I know that for some of us, your, your, your family may not be here, but maybe perhaps someone can, can graft you in and say, you're a part of my family tonight. And we're going to pray together. Because I believe wholeheartedly that strong families build strong churches. I believe wholeheartedly that when the family unit is well, that God's house is well. I believe wholeheartedly that when you're well spiritually, everything else around you will begin to bloom. Everything else around you will begin to prosper. So I want us to pray together. If it's appropriate to grab the hand of the person next to you. So if it's appropriate it is to slip your arm around somebody and say, we're going to pray together. I know that for some of our young people, that maybe your family's not here, but if some of your family's here, grab them by the hand and say, we're going to pray together. Or maybe it's saints of God, let's grab hands together. It's appropriate to grab hands and we're going to pray together. Because I want God to move and I want God to strengthen us. And I want God to touch us and I want God to renew us as a, as a collective body of believers. Let's all pray together right now. Lord, in the name of Jesus, we pray right now.